Okay, we're going to change the meeting up just a little bit. Um, we, the Conquer High School principal um, will be speaking, but he's going to be second or third or fourth or fifth. He had to go get a couple things from the high school, so he'll, he'll be right back. But I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'd especially like to thank Hair Etc. LLC um, for um, being our sponsor tonight, you, for their community support of tonight's meeting. So Hair Etc., thank you so much. And next, I'm assuming that most of you have been to our meetings. Um, if, if not, we have um, presentations from 7 to 8, um, then open house from 8 to about 8.45. And we've been doing this since 2003. We've done quarterly meetings since 2003. And that format seems to work really well. Um, we want to get just as much great positive information and the facts out to you as we can. Um, with the presentations, and then we always hope to um, hope that you'll have a lot of questions for our presenters during the open house, and you can look at all of all of the things they have and all of that. So that's why we do it that way. Um, there's no campaigning. I don't know what you'd be campaigning for tonight, but there is no campaigning, please. Um, and with that, I would like to first of all introduce Steve Harrelson with C Dot. And he needs a really big round of applause because of all that CDOT has done lately. So, Steve. Thank you. Uh, I don't have a ton of updates for this quarter. The, the big project that we just we're just wrapping up on 285 are some passing lanes and a resurfacing all through South Park. We started at uh, Red Hill Pass. We put a climbing lane uh, up Red Hill Pass. We put two passing lanes um, there by Jefferson, and a turning lane at uh, Elkhorn Road in Como, and another passing lane climbing the southerly side of Kenosha Pass. Um, it was an enormous uh, safety problem through there. There's a ton of head-ons, and uh, hopefully this this will address that. Um, we just I did the final punchless walkthrough on Monday, and that project is done. I think uh, the passing lanes they were removed, putting up permanent signing and and getting ready to open those here this week. Um, the other big issue that I've got going on up here is the Schaefer's Crossing median issue. Um, there's those of you who read Pine Cam, I'm sure have uh, heard about the issue where trucks and other traffic are going into the northbound lanes. Um, it's happened. Uh, you know, we've confirmed it probably t a total of ten times in two or three years. We hear a lot of reports. Um, you know, some of them are reports that are it's the same incident. Uh, we've tried a number of things. We've put, we've restriped it a little bit. We've put rumble strips on the double yellow line to try to keep people from drifting over. Um, it looks like we're, well, we, we put a variable message sign that tells people to keep right. Uh, and we put some permanent signing up. And the, the problem is, I think it's gotten better, but it's, it's still happening. Um, we're, under design with a project to extend the depressed median up the hill several hundred feet. Um, packaged with that project, we're going to replace some of the concrete pavement, um, kind of, well, from uh, pretty much the whole concrete paving section to from Richmond Hill down to Turkey Creek Canyon. There are a number of uh, pavement segments that are breaking apart. We're going to replace those and with the same project, um, do this median improvement at Shaver's Crossing. That is probably going to be advertised in early spring so we can start construction as soon as the weather allows. And it should go fairly quickly, just um, you know, two or three weeks, I think, to do all of it. So it shouldn't have much impact to you all. Uh, the only other issue we have um, going on, there's a small project at Pine Junction where they're going to do some restriping and, uh, I guess, site distance improvements at that intersection. We've also been designing a full interchange there. The construction funding of that has not been programmed. It is at least three to five years out. So no major projects in the corridor for at least three to five years. Um, normally I stay until uh, eight o'clock and, and um, answer questions. However, tonight I have to leave at 7.30. So if you have any questions, you can come grab me in the hallway. Um, if you would prefer to call me, I can leave you my phone. Uh, it's 
6913, and I'll, I'll pick that up and leave a message if I'm not there, and I'll try to get back to you if you have any questions that I can't answer tonight. That's it. Thank you, Steve. And I have that phone number if anybody needs it and he's not here. Okay? So next we have the Conifer Area Chair. Um, no. Um, Chairman of the Board, Melissa Baker, um, the Conifer Area Chamber of Commerce. She has all kinds of exciting news. We have a lot of things going on. I'm going to try really hard. Oh, come on, Angela. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, for the business update, Big R is expanding. I don't know how many of you have noticed, uh, but they're expanding their store to include se seasonal items, housework products, decor, and linens. And one of the really new, exciting new businesses in town, we have a toy store now in Conifer at Aspen Park Village. Make sure you stop by and check it out and say hi to Deborah and welcome her to the community. Also coming up, uh, New Year's Day will be the grand opening of the Blue Spruce Habitat for Humanity Restore, also in Aspen Park Village. So make sure you swing by there after you don't stay out too late, um, and welcome to welcome them to Conifer. All right, we've got a lot of events planned, and I'm going to run through this stuff as quickly as I can until Angela cuts me off. Um, this weekend we have our 13th annual wine tasting and silent auction, sponsored by MyMountainTown.com, at the barn at Memorial Park in Marshdale. That's Ron Lewis's barn. And we're combining it this year with our Festival of Trees event. If you're interested in coming to check out the trees, but maybe you're not into wine, you can do the free public viewing from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Again, that's at the barn at Memorial Park. The wine tasting will be that evening from 4.30 to 7.30. It's really exciting. We've got a lot of things planned. We have four wineries, Avante, Aspen Peak Cellars, Creekside, and Spiro. For food, we're, we have Angry Llama, Cabin Creek Smokehouse, Cutthroat Cafe, Gypsy Diner, JJ Madwell's, and Tuscany Tavern, as well as desserts by Yvonne's Patisserie, Robin Coates Dessert Caterer, Rocky Mountain Organa Gold, and Seasonally Yours. There will be a ton of great silent auction items, tickets to Rockies games, Nuggets games, um, all kinds of art, trips, so come on out, get dolled up, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, after that, we have Small Business Saturday coming up, which is Saturday, November 30th. That's the Saturday after Thanksgiving. How many of you know that when you shop locally, 50% of the proceeds stays in your community? So if you're going to go out and you're going to shop the Saturday after Thanksgiving, do me a favor, shop here in Conifer and support your local community. Next up, Saturday, December 7th, is your parade day. This is our 31st annual Conifer Christmas Parade, sponsored by First Bank. We're going to kick it off at 12 p.m. on Sutton Road with Bradford Junction. We have got live entertainment all day long. The Bucktones are going to round it out towards later in the evening. The parade starts at 1.30. Our theme this year is a storytime Christmas, and we have Jesse McKean from Mountain Books as our Grand Marshal. Um, come on out. We've got the Warm Spirits Tent with both non-alcoholic and adult beverages. That's going to be sponsored by Aspen Park Wine and Spirits. We'll have artisan vendors on the parade route. We'll also have festive snacks. Make sure you dress warmly and plan to stay all day. There'll be entertainment. Um, we'll have visits from Santa and Mrs. Claus. Elk Creek Fire Department will have their Santa Land after the event. We'll have the second annual Santa's Milk and Cookie Eating Competition. I don't know how many of you like to eat cookies, but if you don't, it's really fun to watch, and if you do, it's a lot of fun to participate. Um, we'll have the Holiday Wagon Rides in Aspen Park, which was a lot of fun last year. We're doing it again, sponsored by Biggie Liquor. And this year, for the first time, we're doing a holiday raffle. So who couldn't use a little extra holiday cash? For a thousand, it's a chance to win a thousand dollars. Tickets are five dollars a piece, or five for twenty. I've got tickets over here at my table if you want to come see me after the meeting. We're also looking for volunteers in case you want to help us out. It's a lot of fun. You get to watch all the kiddos dressed up and uh, enjoy a great day with your community. Also, mark your calendars for February 22nd. That will be our second annual Mount Lugo Luge. We're combining efforts with the 285 Optimus and their Barrel Stave event at Meyer Ranch Open Space. 
So we'll have a morning of tubing and skiing on the sledding hill over at Meyer Ranch. And then after that, stop by Los Three Garcias. Angela. <laughs> stop by Los Three Garcias for our February beer tasting. It's a lot of fun. Um, so come on out. we got a lot of things going on. And if you have any questions, come over and talk to me after the meeting. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Melissa. You know, we've got a new microphone tonight. Are we waiting too loud? Yes. No? Yes. No? Yes. 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 Okay. We're maybe too loud. Um, we'll try to keep it a little ways. Is that better when it's farther away? Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Well, next we have Peter Parkman um, with Mount Prairie Council, and he's going to go over the development updates with you. Peter. Thank you, Shirley. I can probably keep this pretty short. Uh, things are not happening a whole lot up here. Most of what I see coming through are uh, applications for grading permits and lot adjustments. But in the handout that you picked up when you came in is a list of all the recent activity that's been coming to us. We, we both get emails and, and mails that come through and we try to update this for every meeting. I would call your attention to uh, the Jefferson County Planning and Zoning is addressing the floodplain overlay district and they're looking for comments. Uh, I know most of us in September we realize how good it is to be up here on high ground. We're not quite that the concerns of uh, being flooded as people down in the lowlands are, but if you do live near one of the, the, the streams up here, you may want to take a look at this and see if it impacts you. There's a uh, website, you can direct to the website to find out what these, uh, this overlay district uh, is all about. Um, other than that, we've just had a few cases that have come in, Risen Lord Lutheran Church, uh, they want to allow uh, church uses in the existing commercial center, comments are due in December, uh, stop for gas, I, I see they didn't get all the details on it, they're looking at changing their signs and allowing uh, a U-Haul rental truck in there, and they're having a community meeting tonight. Uh, the other ones in here are, uh, we're here, the last meeting we had, and they're updated in uh, with, with italics, uh, you're free to go to the website. Uh, they have a very good permit search at the Jefferson County website if you want to get more details on these. Um, other than that, it's uh, been pretty quiet. I think the economy is still a little slow up here. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Um, so next we have our representative from RTD, and that's Bruce Daly. Bruce. I think there's a, a few things that you want to talk about here. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Bruce Staley, RTD Board District uh, Representative for Corn for Evergreen. Um, uh, perhaps you uh, noticed when you drive up through Pine Junction, there aren't many cars parked in that dirt lot on the left up there. That is because we have a new parking ride. Pine Junction Park and Ride has been completed and is now open for service. There's 90 spaces, level parking, paved parking. Uh, we've eliminated that awful U-turn that the buses used to have to make in front of the uh, shopette over there. Now they can make their turn inside the parking ride across the post office. Um, we have a very good, very good opening ceremony. I was joined by three other RTD board directors and some of the staff, and uh, Steph Millard. Did you, any of you remember <coughs> Steph yes. Millard? From, he was my predecessor on the board, and he used to, he was the editor of the Fair Play Film for many years. Steph had a terrible stroke, and he's now living in Pueblo, but he made the trip up, and bless his heart, it was great to see Steph again. Uh, there was another uh, very moving service up there also, and if you ever go into the park, and ride, you'll see the memorial in, in behind, next to where the buses pull over. It was a memorial for a gentleman named Dave Apodaca, who was our, one of our planners many years ago that was involved in building all the park and rides up to 285, converting them from dirt lots into decent park and rides, and including buying the land for the, for the current Pine Junction parking line without having any knowledge that we'd ever have the money to build that. 
we did when we, he passed away, unfortunately, some years ago before he saw Park and Ryan even, even being developed. Uh, but his family came up, and it was very nice. And if you ever go into the Park and Ryan, check out his memorial. Uh, there's a little tweak in the service for Colorado, uh, for the C bus that, to downtown, because it takes a few more minutes to drive into the park line and return. So check your schedule, not, not much, just a few minutes on the conifer routes. Uh, as an old RTD bus driver, the one attribute in the new park and ride I really appreciate, because I have to two coffees very early in the morning and a long drive from Denver, we have a, a restroom for the drivers. <laughs> uh, the other thing I want to talk to, about, talk to you about is the new West Corridor. I know it's a little bit off your beaten track, but if you ever go down to Denver, I do recommend that you, you check it out. Uh, you can park at the Taj Mahal. Uh, it's free indoor parking, and they run uh, every 15 minutes, peak period. If you want a little more frequency, drive down to the Federal Center Station, and they run every seven and a half minutes from there. Uh, I actually, I live in Evergreen, and I ride that, that West Corridor to my board meetings. Takes me a little longer, but it's comfortable. Uh, I can read, I can check, check uh, my iPad. And the ridership we were concerned about initially, and we've had a lot of questions about on the West Corridor, uh, we were shooting for 18,000 boardings a day. We started out with about 14,000. Uh, the September numbers are 15,400, so we're creeping up. Now the kids are back at school, they're using it. But we, we're not too alarmed about it because it takes... People have to adjust their traveling habits. They have to adjust to something completely different. So. Please uh, give that a try. I do have some free rides if anyone would like to give that a try. I'll take you into town and back. Uh, a lot going on at RTD, a lot. We just signed another contract for another line to be, to be built on the North Corridor. And I'm out of time, so if you have any questions for me, I'll be available for a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Next, we have Panticosis. He's going to be talking about Colorado spirit, and I'm going to let him tell you what that is. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Panticosis, and I'm here today to talk to you about Colorado spirit. Colorado spirit is a new project, a new program that was uh, created to support all those who were affected by the recent floods in September, and. Uh, it's been running for about a month now. Um, it's funded by FEMA, but it's run by the Jefferson Center for Mental Health. Our team has developed a double expertise. One side is counseling and the mental health side of things, which we have counselors in our team. But what we find helping mostly folks who have been affected by the floods is practical things that have to do with resource access. Where to go to uh, apply for help, or, um, you know, the FEMA is the classic one, and people who don't know how to do that, um, talking about uh, how to deal with mold, or how to deal with, uh, what to do with their water, well water, or things like that. Practical things. Um, we are available seven days a week, and we're very happy to go whatever people need us, whether it's a public place, a library, or a coffee shop, and we can help them out with the paperwork, so to speak, that side of, of assistance. We've been around in this community. We're going covering Jefferson County and Clear Creek. We're dedicated team for that, and we'll be around until hopefully around September next year. So it's not a one-off, and uh, we love to talk to as many of you as possible today. Uh, we're right there, and we have our contact information. And uh, please feel free to come and say hi, and uh, just spread the word. I know you're thinking, I haven't been affected by flood up here, and I understand that, but you may know people who have been affected and are keeping quiet, especially people who perhaps are frail, elderly, disabled, and they just don't do anything about difficult times like this and how to deal with that. So please spread the word. This is free. They won't pay anything for this. 
and we're very happy to go and help them. Okay? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pam. And now I would like to introduce to you um, our new Conifer High School principal, um, Mr. Wes Paxton. Wes, welcome. So good evening, my name is Wes Paxton. I'm the proud, slightly new principal of Conifer High School. This is my, I think, fifth month working at high school, and we're off to a great start this year. Um, this is my 22nd year in education and 16 years in administration, and I'm really privileged to be the principal of Conifer High School. And you probably ask why? Because we have outstanding students at our school. In addition, we have great parents who support the school, and we have a great community that we have our school located in. And we really appreciate all the support you're giving to our school, and the parents continue to provide to our school. Fall sports have kind of come to a close now, so we're gearing up for winter sports. I would strongly encourage you to come out, see what's going on at the school. We had a play last weekend, the butler did it. Some pictures from the play are being shown behind me. And it, we had a great turnout of people come out and support of the arts. And that's one thing we're really proud of, is we have great visual arts and performing arts. In fact, our marching band went to state competition and came back with third in the state in their class. A great accomplishment, great amazing students, yes. And you only had a little bit of a taste of the quality of performance our students had tonight when we had our jazz band over here performing tonight. We just have amazing artistic students. In addition, we have fantastic teachers who are really doing a great job of preparing our students for the next step. Whether it's going into college, going into the military, going into the workforce, our teachers are making sure that our students have that little bit of an edge over students elsewhere to make sure they're prepared. And that goes for our math, our science, our English, our social studies, and our electives. So we're very proud of our teachers. We're working really hard to meet the needs of our students. And if you know students who are eighth graders looking at going to high school next year, Think about Conifer. We have a great program in there. We have a great culture. We really wrap ourselves around the students, making sure they're feeling safe and supported. And the students really integrate. We have a very diverse population. It's a real great learning environment. So let me highlight a little bit for you. I'm going to change the pictures here to a video that one of our parents put together that really does highlight the accomplishments of our school and the accomplishments of our students.
So I just want to kind of highlight a little bit of our school. If you think about it, we're the small schoolhouse up on the hill. We have about a little over 800 students at our school. And you look at the accomplishments of our students, it's pretty impressive when we're competing against larger schools in the valley, like Lakewood, Dakota Ridge, Chatfield, Columbine. And our st students are able to compete that level with the small school size we have. So we really have an amazing school there. And I really want you to check it out. You can check it out by going to our Facebook page, a second here. So our Facebook page is facebook.com conifer high school and um, if you like our page you'll get an update of our announcements, our pictures, we highlight a lot that's going on. In fact, we'll be highlighting the students we're performing tonight, but you really get a sense of what our students are doing every day and what they're doing at night to compete and demonstrate their knowledge and abilities in activities and athletics. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention and please check us out. Come over, send people over to check us out too because we really are a great school. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Is Casey here yet? Okay. Well, wait on, wait on that for a minute. Okay. Um, Mountain Resource Center. We have another introduction to make, and that is Lori McLeod. Um, she's the new director of Mountain Resource Center. Lori. Thank you very much. Um, like she just said, my name is Lori McLeod. I'm CEO of Mountain Resource Center. And as of November 29th, I will be in my position for three months. So I'm not only new to my position, but I'm also new to the community. And I have had the biggest welcome I have ever had anywhere I've ever lived. So I really think that this community is outstanding. I've never seen a community that gives and gives and gives in so many ways. And I am sure that there are people sitting out here tonight that have given to Mountain Resource Center either through their time financially, um, in all sorts of ways. And I really, really want to say thank you to the community for that. Because if it wasn't for our volunteers, we would not have Mountain Resource Center. We rely heavily on volunteers. Last year, we had over 300 volunteers that helped us um, provide services in this community. And last year, we provided over 14,000 services, and 5,000 individuals were the recipients of those services. And I kind of wanted to go through those services with you and just letting you know that we've been serving um, and supporting the mountain area for the last 23 years. And we're a nonprofit 501c3. And we rely a lot on donations, capital campaigns, um, foundation money, different types of grants. So it takes a wide variety of funding sources to provide the services that we are giving to our community. Um, and you probably heard our biggest branding piece, which is Neighbors Helping Neighbors. And we do that in so many different ways. One of the ways is through our food pantry. We have a lot of churches that help provide um, food assistance to our clients that are in need. And we have family development type of services, which helps families connect with comprehensive services that help them to strengthen their families and become self-reliant. And 92% of our revenue actually goes into direct services, which is a huge amount of money going directly back into our community, with only about 8% of that in admin. So for the size of our organization, um, that just means that we're able to provide those 15,000 individual services. Last year, we did see an increase in our food pantry of 150%. So we 
tried to figure out why would that be, but what we related it to was um, job loss and our community's difficulty in recovering from the recession, and that um, increased the usage of our food pantry. We also, just in the last year, really have beefed up our workforce services. We received the Mile High um, United Way grant, which allowed us to expand our workforce. And if anybody would like to come and have a tour of our facility, I would love to um, show you around. We just had a big build out in our workforce services area, so we're going to have a computer lab back there. And we're able to provide all kinds of different workshops, job skills, seeking um, on the internet, resume writing. I think we just finished one on small businesses, how to start your own business. And we'll continue offering those to the community throughout the year. And last year we um, served 132 people in our work for services, but I think we're already at, um, we're, we've surpassed that this year, 2013. And obviously we're known for our disaster relief. Um, we really helped out with the North Fork fire. And with the recent floods, we thought that we may have um, some people, some uh, of our clients impacted in the areas that we served, but to date we have not had any needs in that area. So um, we were kind of surprised with that, but I'm also thankful for that as well. Let me see. We have health services, which we provide families of pediatric medical services in our community, and we served over 1,800 people in that. And I don't know if anybody um, has shopped at our retail store. But that is a fabulous store. I can't believe it. We um, actually almost everything I'm wearing tonight is from the resale store. <laughs> I'm glad to see Jose. I shop there all the time. We have fabulous items in our resale store, and all the money that we do receive in our resale store obviously goes back into direct services to our clients. We had, like I said, I think earlier, we had over 300 volunteers helping out in all of these areas that we provide services in, and that equaled out to be about 8,000 hours of volunteer, volunteer services. Um, and I, I think most of everyone knows that every year we do put on a holiday party for our families in need. And if anyone would like to help us with that, we would very much appreciate that. And I put flyers in the back as to how you might be able to help us. We take donations for um, babies, children, and teens. Um, gift cards. Um, we also have, um, you can also donate your time by helping us to set up the party, organize the toys, and during the event on December 14th, um, we can use volunteers to help with our craft activity tables, assist us with our food tables, and then obviously after the event, um, we always need volunteers to help us clean up and pack up our decorations. So we would just very much appreciate anything that you could give us. And I just really want to say hi to everybody. And if you'd like to come and see our facility, please give us a call. We'll give you a tour. And I just really thank you very much for the welcome that you've given me in this community. And I'm proud to be a member. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, and definitely welcome. Okay, before our next speaker comes up, which will be Casey, I just want to ask, um, did you all get emails for tonight's meeting? Okay, good. I didn't. And so we're just trying to make sure that every, we've got a new vertical response email system. You guys didn't? Okay. Okay, so we we'll need to make a note of that. And so we just wanted to make sure that everybody did get an email. We're, we're working all the kinks out. And um, if anybody is not already on the list, we do have a list going back here. So please get on that list for future ones. We'll have all the keys made um, out of there for the next one. And now I would like to welcome Casey Ty. He's um, one of our Jefferson County Board of Commissioners. They've been working on the budget, and Casey really loves to do that. And he's, he's good at it anyway. So he's going to talk a little bit about how that is you know, affecting us and a lot of other things. Casey. Thanks for that. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, great drive up here. It gets dark awfully early. <laughs> it's just not as much fun as it is during the summer. But anyway, I'll talk about a couple of things. I've been a commissioner for about a year now. And in that time, we've had fires. We've had floods. 
I'm hoping we don't have a big snowstorm tonight, but I guess you, you never know. But anyway, I'll talk real briefly, I'm talk about the budget. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the flood recovery. And I want to say thanks to a lot of the uh, people who helped with the flood. Our sheriff's office did a great job. Uh, we did not have any loss of life in the flood in Jefferson County. And that is because we have a lot of people who got word out quickly, who responded to emergencies quickly. We had a lot of citizens who took good uh, precautions and made good common sense decisions. So we didn't have any loss of life. And I think uh, we all should be thankful for that. I think you said numbers, as far as Jefferson County goes, we had big problems uh, you know, on Highway 72. That was our biggest area. We also had some problems in other areas around town, and we had some issues in, in Upper Bear Creek. Uh, compared to Boulder, our problems weren't as bad, but they were still pretty serious. I'm going to give you some numbers that are more reflective to the state as a whole, because we're still working with FEMA on assessing how much damage we have. There's two ways you can get uh, uh, money back from FEMA. You can either go reimbursement method, or you can kind of estimate what your costs are and negotiate a one-time cost. And you say, you take it, if your costs are more than that, that's too bad. We're, we're going with the reimbursement approach. And we're still assessing some of our costs. We're still gathering data on what our costs are. We have a lot of uh, damage to our open space parks. Where, uh, Apex Park is still closed because of all the damage. We're trying to get those parks open again. We want to make sure they're safe for the, uh, for the citizens. As far as uh, total registrations from all counties, 27,617 people registered for assistance. Uh, $53 million in assistance went to people. It's been proof of this people of Colorado. Housing assistance, $49 million. Um, SBA low interest loans, $66 million. Um, completed home inspections, $24,000. Um, so you can see there's a lot of uh, damage to the state of Colorado. Uh, FEMA sent 825 volunteers to the, to the state. $9 million in uh, public assistance to the various uh, counties and cities has already been paid. So it was, it was quite a flood. Uh, we had three bridges damaged in Upper Bear Creek, totaling $93,000. We lost lots of guardrail. The cost so far is $36,000 to repair that. It might be a little bit more than that. Um, in Coal Creek, total road damage was $7.5 million. Um, all our roads are now open. And I want to thank CDOT. That road, uh, we went toured the area, that road was washed out. How CDOT got it open before Thanksgiving, they deserve a lot of credit. Our road crews as well helped out. It's, uh, it's been amazing. Uh, the contractors, it's been really impressive. So uh, that's what's going on as far as, as the floods go. Uh, I want to thank, the uh, again, the Sheriff's officers and anybody else that helped. Uh, one other item I'll talk about real quick before I talk about the budget, and that's uh, the Western Beltway. We call that West Connect now. We're trying to come up with a, uh, a motor transportation that flows all the way from the north part of I-25, going all the way through Jefferson County to the south along C-470, uh, back to 25, and complete that loop around the metropolitan area. Uh, we're still working toward getting that done. There's a couple of things in the hopper. One thing that might interest you is they're talking about adding lanes to C-470 from I-25 east to Kipling. That would probably be a toll lanes if they add those. Uh, we're working with the uh, CDOT to see if that makes sense, if we can add two toll lanes. The, remain, the other lanes will remain uh, uh, free, I guess you call them. They wouldn't be tolls, but any additional capacity would be tolls uh, going east from Kipling uh, to uh, I-25. And then on the other side, where we don't have the Beltway completed yet, we're still looking at how we're going to do that. Golden has come up with a plan they call the Golden Plan, which allows for two uh, lanes to go through Golden in each direction along Highway 93 and 6th Avenue. Uh, there would be great separations. They would have interchanges, so they'd get rid of those stoplights on 93 and 6th Avenue to allow free flow of traffic. Then going uh, north and west of uh, Golden, uh, that's where the Jefferson Parkway comes in, and that would be a private toll road uh, going north of Highway 93 and connecting with the uh, Northwest Parkway. And that's still being looked at. We have a private concessionaire that's considering that. They would build it, they would run it, they would be responsible for it, uh, but that hasn't been finalized yet. We're still we're looking at that as a complete beltway around the metropolitan area. And now I'll come to the budget. And uh, there's not a lot of good news with the, uh, with the budget, I'll tell you that. Um, over the last several years, the, uh, the county's been dipping into its savings account. 
Uh, we had at one time a $75 million fund balance. That fund balance has been going down each year. And uh, we're projecting that in future years, if we don't do some, something to address the concerns, we'll get down to a fund balance of almost nothing. So we gotta make some changes. We also have some great employees that work for the county, and they haven't received a pay raise in quite a while. We're hoping we can give those employees a 3% pay raise this year. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, after seeing what happened with the floods, and seeing what happened with the fires, and seeing what they do in everyday activities, not just when disasters hit. We've got good employees in this county, and we're losing them. We've got some, we've got some sheriff's officers standing back there. I, I know that there's been some stuff in the press about the sheriff's officers leaving for other jurisdictions because other jurisdictions are paying more. And that hurts in a lot of ways. One is we lose uh, good officers to other jurisdictions. The other problem is it costs a lot of money to train sheriff's deputies. Uh, I'm guessing, that they, I think it's a little over $100,000 to train a sheriff's deputy. So if they leave, that's a huge investment that the county loses. And so we've got to remain competitive with other jurisdictions. That's also true with human services. We've got a lot of attrition in our human services. These people provide a lot of important work for taking care of, uh, uh, of kids who are in a, a, a dangerous situations with uh, problems with their families. And we aren't paying those people very well. We need to make sure we do that. So we want to make sure we give these people a, a, a competitive wage. So we're looking at a 3% pay increase. And that will bring them up to being competitive. I don't think that's exorbitant. So what does that mean to you guys? Well, this is where the, the bad news comes in. And I, I want to tell you something. I'll, I'll give it to you straight. Uh, the county's been working under the authorized bill levy for the last nine years. The voters authorized, authorized us a mill levy of about 26 mills. Now what's a mill? A mill is basically how we determine what you're going to pay in taxes based on the value of your property. And uh, 26 mills gives us our, our revenue for the county. The um, property values have gone down over the last several years since the recession. And that means the revenue to the county has also gone. They're not taking in as much revenue and property taxes as we took in in, say, 2011. So if we increase our mill levy by 1.5 mills, that will generate about $10 million for the county. That will bring us back up to about the level we were at in 2011. It will bring us back to the 2011 revenue levels. What does that mean to the taxpayer? Well, if you have a $250,000 house, that will be approximately a $50 um, increase in your property taxes for a year. In other words, your property tax is about $50 for a year. I think they said one mill is about $30 in property taxes for the year. So we're looking at increasing our mill levy to the authorized mill levy amount, uh, which would be 1.5 mills. And that would bring us an extra $10 million. It's a decision we haven't made lightly. We're, we're considering our budget on uh, Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock is when we have our final budget vote. Uh, believe me, we've looked at what's going on in the county. We've looked at our, uh, our cost savings areas. We've asked people to tighten their belts. And so we think that this is probably the best, um, the best approach right now. But I'll tell you, we're, we're uh, hoping that property values will increase in coming, in coming years. And then we can uh, maybe take another voluntary bill levy reduction. So uh, uh, do we take questions or after the fact that we do? Okay, afterwards. I'll be around afterwards to talk about uh, West Connect or to talk about the budget or any other questions you have about what's going on in the county. So thank you very much. Thanks, Casey. We'll hope to have you up again this year. Okay, um, as Mimi is getting set up, I just have a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, um, our trails team did the silent auction at the Holiday Boutique, um, put on by Conifer Newcomers and Neighbors. And thank you all that are here that um, purchased anything from that. Um, and that just, you know, we're at the Holiday Boutique, I think it was a big success. Um, we made a lot of money for trails. We still had a few items left. And there's a few things back there that you can bid on if you would like. We would, we would love to have you do that. And it'll all go for um, trails up here. Next, we have the um, Salvation Army. The bell ringing is happening, of course, this year, um, as always. 
And back at this table right back here, um, <laughs> is that Jackie? <laughs> Jackie's back there to um, take your name and everything if you'd like to ring the bell for the Salvation Army. It's a lot of fun. You meet all your neighbors and take your dog with you and, you know, have a lot of fun. Um, and I'd like to announce, too, that um, there's a bunch of pens on the back table, and that's Hair Etc. has brought those, so please take a pen with you. Um, they're kind of cool. Yeah, we've got little pointers, little flashlights going on all over the place here. Um, they've got a pen and a flashlight, so please take one of those with you. I bet you, you could probably even take a couple. So, um, our next um, speaker is Mimi Mather, and she's um, with, let me, let me find it. Root House Studio, and uh, that is the consultant that we have um, used for the Confer Recreation Coalition, and she's going to talk a little bit about um, all of the things that they're working on, and we'd really like your input tonight, so she'll talk about that too. Mimi. Good evening, everybody. So, on behalf of the Conifer Recreation Coalition, aka CRC, I'm just going to give you a quick lowdown on Project Place. I will be speaking kind of quickly because I've got a lot to cover, so I encourage you to come talk to me and Jean from Jeffco Open Space afterwards. So, who is the Conifer Recreation Coalition? They're made up of a group of citizens and organizations that have come together to discuss the amazing recreational assets and opportunities in the Conifer area and to examine unmet needs. And this fall, the CRC launched Project Place, which is in an effort to promote and improve the region's recreational programs, facilities, and experiences. And I want to set the record straight and let everybody know this is not a recreation district effort. This is a master planning project of sorts. It's not your typical master planning project. So CRC's Project Place is a citizen-driven initiative, and it's got four purposes. I'll walk through all four of them. The first one is to study and enhance the Conifer area's recreation experiences. Second one, to identify what residents really want in terms of recreation. And thirdly, to develop objectives for improving upon existing recreation opportunities. And finally, prioritize future recreation enhancements and then outline strategies for getting to those enhancements. So there's two audiences for Project Place. The first one, and the primary audience, is you guys. It's the Conifer area residents. The second audience are tourists and travelers who might come to the Conifer area, draw to the Conifer area by its recreation resources. So here's the map of the area in blue. It's not just Conifer, it's the Conifer area. It's basically the same area that the 285 community area plan addressed. And Project Place is looking at recreation in its most broadest sense. So we'll be looking at recreation on public lands. We'll be looking at activities and classes and programs, not just recreation facilities. We'll be looking at the type of recreation that brings the community together and connects the Conifer community with the outdoors and its natural resources. And finally, we'll be looking at the broad range of recreation experiences. So everything from visits to historic sites, to taking a dance class, to outdoor adventures. That's all comes within the, the recreation envelope. So somebody might ask, why bother with such an effort? Three quick reasons. One, it's a blueprint. This project place will establish a framework and guidelines for future recreation development in the area. Secondly is funding. Any funder is going to want to see that you've identified your community's needs, that you prioritize project before they're going to give you some dollars. And then finally, Recreation just gets a smiley face because it's good for community health, it's good for the mental health, it's good for the physiological health of residents, and it's good for the economic health because in Colorado, recreation is a real driver of tourism. So Project Place is going to uh, result in two deliverables. The first one being a real concise plan that's going to identify the priority projects, it's going to outline strategies for realizing those projects. And the second part, which I'm pretty excited about, is a, is a really simple but beautiful website that's going to capture what's here already. So it's going to get at 
what people can see and do in the recreation area. And then it'll also include um, information and maps that, that get at what, rec con what recreation and conifer could be in the future. So right now we're at the community input phase of the project. Like I said, we just launched it in the fall, and this winter we will be talking to as many residents and stakeholders as we can, and we'll essentially be asking two different questions using a number of outreach tools. We want to know what do you want and what do you need in terms of recreation improvements, and then secondly, we want to know what's working well that's already here and what's worth checking out. Where should we be sending people? And those people, again, being residents or visitors. So we, we held a public meeting, a public workshop, our first one, a week ago in this same room, and we got a lot of great input. Um, I'm not going to read off this list, and it's only a sampling of it. There are a lot more bullet points. But everything from we need expanded trail systems, cross-country ski area, living history museum, microbreweries, um, beer in Colorado counts as recreation. Um, <laughs> We need group recreation opportunities. We need better information, maps, calendars about recreation. So this is the kind of input I'd love to get from you guys tonight. Um, we also have started to develop the best of confer lists. I've got a handful of lists over on the table over there where we've bulleted out what people have already told us, but we'd love to get your ideas. And to make it, to make it easy for you, over there you'll see a few tools. Sticky notes, just write your idea on here. I can read almost any handwriting, so don't worry about that. Um, stars, if there's an idea that you already like, no need to rewrite it, just stick a star on it. And then finally, we're running a, a survey, a digital survey. It takes at most 10 minutes, and I please encourage you, please take it. And then take one of these cards. No, don't take one, take like 20 of these cards. I've got a bunch of them and there's no need for me to bring them back to Boulder. So take a bunch of cards and hand them out to your friends and your families, um, work, co-workers. Get, let's get as many people as we can because what we're asking for is what's the best econifer in this survey and what do you need in terms of recreation. And that's all I've got. I, I encourage you to stay in touch with Project Place. You can find us on Facebook if you do that. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Um, we've got a nice looking website that started at conifercoalition.org. So thanks for your input. Thank you, Mimi. Um, we did have, uh, Sherry Giroux was going to try to be here tonight. She was not able to make it. Um, so that is our last speaker. Um, but I would just like to talk to you a little bit. We had some fabulous presentations tonight, lots of great information. But this is our smallest crowd ever in 11 years. So um, I, I would just like to request that you all, you know, tell a friend, um, ask a neighbor, um, get some more people out. Um, because we have, we, we always have so much great information at these meetings and um, everybody needs to hear it, you know, not just a handful of people. So thank you so much for all of you being here. Um, we really appreciate that. I know the snowstorm's coming tonight, but it's not here yet, I don't think. Um, so anyway, if you can stick around for a little bit, we have lots of people to talk to back here. Um, we have the Salvation Army, the Silent Auction for Trails. Um, we've got the Connor for Recreation Coalition wanting to know information on all kinds of stuff. We have Casey here to talk about the budget and anything else you'd like to talk about as far as the um, Board of County Commissioners in Jefferson County. And um, we have other speakers and other people here, so please stick around, ask every question you can think of, and we hope to see you. The next meeting is February, somebody help me out here. February 12th, thank you. So the next town hall meeting is February 12th, right here at 7 o'clock. We hope to see you here with all of your neighbors and friends. Thanks so much for coming tonight.